Okay, uh, well, it is my honor, everyone, to introduce Adal Shimahamadi today. Many of you know him really well, uh, since he's had a long and distinguished career at the University of Maryland. Uh, but let me take you back to 1974. Uh, that was the year that Adele graduated with a BS degree in agricultural engineering from the University of Rizayek. Rizayek. All oh, right, yes, in northwestern Iran. That's near the Turkish border. Uh, and as I mentioned to Adele just before, I looked online. It's a beautiful area. Love to go there one day. Has a big uh, salt lake from what I saw uh, close by. So, but after Adele graduated in 1979, he then set off for Lincoln, Nebraska to complete a master's degree in agricultural engineering from the University of Nebraska. And after that, Adele stayed in the US to complete a PhD at North Carolina State University uh, in 1982. So he started at the University of Maryland in 1986, I believe, as an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural Engineering which I think later became the Department of Biological Resources Engineering, which uh, was one of the two departments that eventually amalgamated to become the Department of Environmental Science and Technology in 2007. I, th I think we need a departmental historian just to keep track of all of this. But um, Adele quickly established very successful research teaching programs. He got promoted to associate and full professors. He received numerous awards. He was made a fellow by the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineering in 2005. He received a Presidential Outstanding Service Award uh, by the same society in 2011. Um, and in 2009, of course, as many of you know, Adele was appointed the Associate Dean for Research and Associate Director of the Maryland Agricultural Experimental Station, where he served for just over 10 years uh, until January 2020. So besides the, the normal day-to-day -day management in that position, he also spearheaded a number of initiatives to foster greater research productivity within our college. Uh, so he helped form AgPass, which of course is the pre-award processing unit that we use to help us submit grants. He established more interaction between our college with USDA NEFA. He led lots of faculty down to their offices in Washington, DC to, to meet with program officers. He's organized numerous symposia. He executed a research agreement with the Rural Research Institute in South Korea. He has established an interagency water consortium here in Maryland to help foster relationships between the university with uh, state agencies and other institutions. And besides doing all of that, he has also continued to be active in research. And I've had the pleasure of working with Adele on a number of projects. One of the things that stands out about Adele is that he's always willing to help and mentor young faculty and that's been a terrific asset for our department and for the wider college. So after all of those accomplishments, I think Adele deserved a sabbatical, which is what he's going to talk about today, I believe. So uh, I'd like to hand it over to you, Adele. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, wow, wow. Well, uh, Paul, from now on, if I need um, uh, to get some promotions or raises and stuff, I'll ask you to talk with my bosses. So, <laughs> but thank you, thank you so much for this very generous uh, uh, introduction, um, and I appreciate. And Mardi and and Stephanie, thank you for inviting me, facilitating this seminar. Um, so, uh, you know, it has been uh, really a pleasure for me and. Some of us, you know, Mardi, Bob Hill, and some of us go back long ways. Uh, we have collaborated in different uh, dimensions. I am only naming them because we, uh, we are old timers. <laughs> you know, yes, I came to Maryland in 86. And uh, so I appreciate really all the interactions I have had with many great colleagues uh, during my career here in Maryland. And, and so 
Yes, uh, so today I will be talking about um, uh, my sabbatical experience really. You know, it's a little bit different sabbatical experience. Uh, usually like my first sabbatical in 1995, I went to Sweden, Swedish University of Ag Sciences, the division of uh, hydrotechnique. Uh, you know, I did more preferential flow post modeling as well as measurements like experimental measurements and dye movements through the preferred structured soils and so on and so forth. So that was research and published several papers, got several grants to Swedish government, which lasted another four years. Uh, so I selected every summer, you know, to go two weeks to Sweden during those daylight hours, it was great. But this was really, I didn't really uh, had an appetite to go far away. And I really wanted to, after for 10 years, over 10 years in Ag Experimental Station, I wanted to get a little bit more into NIFA. And as you all know, our colleague uh, and friend, my friend, uh, Scott Angle, who was the director of our Ag Experimental Station before going to Georgia in, uh, I believe, 2000, God, uh, maybe uh, five or something, 2006, uh, becoming a dean there. And now, of course, he's the um, vice chancellor for IFAS in University of Florida. But at the time, last year, he was the director of uh, NIFA. And we were talking and he said, you know, you're most welcome if you want to spend your six months sabbatical with us. And we, you know, NIFA had moved to Kansas City. This is the his story. And, and so they are trying to really see how they can reimagine their operations. And so anyway, we, we were talking sidelines. This was before my um, sabbatical. And of course, as a uh, Ag Experimental Station Associate Director, uh, we, I interacted with both National Experimental Station Directors as well as NERA, Northeast Association of Experiment. So the, I, and APLU, Association of Public Land Grant Universities. So they wanted to do this sort of collected data and come up with the strategies. What are the goods, bads, positives, and comments, what needs to be done? And they had they actually employed a consulting firm. I'll, I'll talk later on. And, and then anyway, so they collected data. So anyway, before I go off track, so I had two, basically, I want to report on two tasks, two areas. One, the task on CAFE, which is the board that uh, is related to collaboratively achieving functional excellence for NIFA, and that's really reimagining NIFA. So they asked me to chair the committee. And the second item that I want to report on is that um, on the cybersecurity and AR uh, area that they got me involved, uh, I was temporarily assigned as a national program leader. Uh, you know, they, they put you as a detail and give you a temporary title. Uh, you go through the security clearance and all that, but either way. So, and the, so that under the um, cybersecurity multi and AI stuff, uh, I got involved with both AI, IWG, artificial intelligence interagency working group, as well as with the uh, joint NIFA NSF uh, proposal review and funding process for AI institutes. And so, um, let's see if I can. Um, so, First Project Cafe, uh, again, reimagining USDA NIFA. Uh, it, was, uh, it was something that I, I chaired. Um, so what, what happened was, I don't know if you all can, can see the slide well, or my, on my screen, actually, I see that, uh, let me see if I can get rid of this. Um, okay. Uh, so maybe now you can see, I don't know, uh, the pictures were uh, sort of taking, taking it over, but uh, the members included myself as a chair and Mike Fitzner, I don't know if any of you know, Mike is uh, acting deputy director for NIFA Institute of Food Production and Sustainability. Uh, David Tenge, who is the program specialist at NIFA IPS Division of Animal Systems. Vates Ralson, who was the who is the division director, uh, Office of Grants and Financial Management, and Erin Reinley. Erin basically is a national program leader um, for uh, National NIFA's Institute of Youth, Families, and Consumers. So these were four people from NIFA, and as as you may see, there was Mind Light Solutions, 
uh, which is a management consultant organization, they really helped to collect the data. And Lainey Copeland was a young lady, politically was assigned basically to represent um, NIFA's political dimension to make sure that we are online, I guess. I don't understand totally all the government uh, operations, but, but there were some politics involved. And then NIFA's executive council included basically Scott Engel, Parak Chitnis, who was deputy director, and later on he became acting director when Scott left in the middle of the game. And, and so they made the final you know, determination what sort of recommendations that we were making uh, should actually be implemented or should not be implemented and so on. But also they were communicating our activities to uh, research, education, and, and uh, extension uh, component of USDA discuss Hutchinson uh, is the director. And, and so they were keeping everybody basically uh, abreast of what's going on. Okay, let's see if I can advance this. Okay, so what was the purpose of CAFE? To fulfill NIFA's scientific mission by improving the effectiveness and efficiency of service delivery and goals were optimize NIFA's service delivery approach to better align with current business practices and technologies. And a second goal was identify solutions NIFA can implement near term and long term. That was really the, uh, the goal. NIFA asked basically four questions. You know how we went through the visioning and so on. We had external facilitate. In this case, really, what they did was they had the external uh, sort of the mind light solutions as, as a group that collected the data and helped us, the CAFE board, to synthesize and analyze. But really, initially, they basically posed four questions, as you see down below, to all their basically stakeholders, including APLU, including land grant universities, government agencies, some of the uh, professional societies. You will see the list uh, in, in a few minutes. So, and these questions were, how can NIFA improve delivery of capacity programs for supporting research and extension? Remember, those of you who are not familiar, capacity programs are formula funding that annually ag experimental stations and, and extension offices, all days cooperative extension, they receive some formula funding based on a historical sort of trend, the size of uh, the capacity of the, the colleges and, and, and so on. So those formula funds, for example, for ag experimental station or extension in our college, they, lots of them are as, a, appropriated to some of the salaries of the faculty, whether extension or, or research. And, and some of it is whatever is remaining, then uh, we spend it both to keep our, for example, in Maryland, our research and education centers going on, and as well as uh, helping with some competitive grant programs and some seed money for certain things and so on and so forth, and multi-state project support and, and whatnot. Anyway, that's really the first question was regarding the capacity programs and so on, that how they can do best to do that. The second was, what changes could improve NIFA's implementation of competitive programs? And these are AFRI, AFRI foundational and all of the above. How can NIFA increase transparency and effectiveness of organizational structure? And the fourth one was what steps can NIFA take to enhance customer experience? So <clears throat> what are the, who are the NIFA's uh, stakeholders? NIFA's primary external really partners are land grant universities. Those are us like University of Maryland and Penn State and all of the above nationally. NIFA's external uh, stakeholders uh, also include farmers, ranchers, families, and uh, families and, and American taxpayers, really all of the above, citizens of US. NIFA employees themselves are stakeholders for NIFA. They have to make sure that employees are on board and with decisions that they make and activities that they, they take on. And fourth one, partner science agencies, including internal USDA agencies, such as USDA ARS or other agencies such as NSF, EPA, DOE, and so on and so forth. So 900 comments from 40 sources were collected as a result of those four questions that were dispatched uh, basically to different platforms. Uh, these platforms, I was actually part of the APLU 
that when these questions were formed, they went to different um, uh, northeast region, southern region, western region, ag experimental station, extension boards, and so on, but also all the land grants, uh, their offices through dean's offices, post uh, 1890s schools of it, as well as 1862. 1890s are, uh, you know, the historically um, uh, black and minority schools serving uh, basically. Um, and then there are Falcon, for example, you see on this left hand side, uh, American, uh, you know, first American land grant consortium Falcon. These are tribal colleges and universities and so forth. And so, and then, you know, I mean, this list is large, so I'm not going to go through this, of course, uh, but uh, they also pose to some of the professional societies. As you can see, American Society of Plant Biologists, American Society of uh, Agronomy was somewhere here, crop sciences, soil sciences, and so forth. Uh, I was uh, I was a little, a little bit shocked that actually uh, ASABE did not provide any comments, my own society, but either way. And then they had some national agencies, as you can see on the right-hand side. Some of them are USDA-related agencies, and, and some of them uh, other agencies, such as National Science Foundation and, uh, and different divisions of them, computer information sciences and engineering and biological sciences. And, uh, you know, uh, universities, some of them are listed in here separately because even though they really fall under these uh, uh, regional associations of ag experimental stations and so on. Either way, and then those, those were like 36 of them. And then four others were basically internal uh, sessions within the uh, employees of NIFA. Four sessions were held in Kansas City uh, for the group to uh, brainstorm and provide feedback. And, and one session in DC, uh, there are about 19, 20 uh, scientists of NIFA still remaining in DC. And then uh, they had a uh, employee suggestion box that actually uh, NIFA employees could also provide suggestions in that. So this is a, a timeline of activities that CAFE uh, work plan took, phase one, phase two, phase three. You know, I joined my sabbatical started March 1st and uh, in here feedback in terms of gathering feedback, the 900 comments started way back January 1st of 2020. And then we really started basically uh, end of March or yeah, somewhere first week of March started analyzing the data that group, the board, in other words, cafe board that I listed the names and we went on. And this is a little bit uh, sort of uh, older slide, but you, you can see that we were basically Along the lines, we were providing status report for the executive council and, and getting feedback and, and providing implementations and so on. And then this is, a, this is the updated one that actually yesterday I contacted with MindLight Solutions. They sent me the updated slide where the cafe work plan is at. So as you can see, and you will see what kind of recommendations we made later on, but you know, all the feedback and recommendations for improvement really finished around first week of uh, August. Our final report also was delivered basically in that first week and my sabbatical ended at the end of August, by the way. And, and, and then implementation of quick action items actually started while I was there and I participated in a couple of them just as a, um, you know, answering some questions if they had and, and so on and so forth. But it has continued and, and really, as you can see, they have completed uh, those quick action items for most part. And you will see the percentage and the long-term recommendations have started and they're moving forward. So uh, one of the things was the transparency, clarity and consistency, the trust that they wanted to build for NIFA amongst their stakeholders. In order to do that, uh, they had to pay attention, optimize the you know, processes in key grant life cycle stages. I won't read these. You can, basically there were lots of you know, complaints that NIFA's uh, RFAs and, and uh, sort of grant cycle itself from the time that RFAs come out, funding, when the funds become available, they're all haywire and people were complaining. Those are in that regard increased communication and outreach. So improved documentation and messaging, established foundation of knowledge, 
In other words, uh, this goes basically that they wanted NIFA across the NIFA, across the agency to have a knowledge that knowledge base that customers, stakeholders can really know its division, what they are doing. Establish, uh, in, excuse me, improve use of website and other technologies effectively, for example. Address capacity fund programs. This capacity fund is a sticky point because there's a lots of congressional politics played with it that some portions of the politics says that capacity funds should be converted to competitive, but land grants argument is that if we didn't have capacity funds, we even didn't have faculty to, to employ faculty to be able to go after competitive grants. So it's a very sticky point. And then address matching funds and indirect costs. These are things that always uh, are uh, sort of uh, arguments or discussions amongst them. I gotta watch my time here, but anyway, so uh, improvement opportunities through our data analysis and synthesis, we basically came up with um, eight quick action, quick action items or short-term uh, opportunities, uh, improvement opportunities, and long-term improvement. We, we came up with 40 of them. So eight short-term and 40 long-term in these different thematic areas, as you can see, outreach, communication, process, technology, talent management, leadership, strategic planning and governance, and so on and so forth. So these are near-term or short-term opportunities that was suggested, but this is only a snapshot of it because we had eight and we are only showing a snapshot of some of the things that were included in there. Um, those were like in terms of talent management process, communication and documentation, which shows up in both areas here, like reinforced improvement for all panels to provide useful comments and feedback to the applicants. The complaint was from the comments that, you know, people that are submitting grant proposals from the review committees or panels, sometimes they don't really, they get vague comments. They don't get useful comments or feedback to be able to improve their proposals. So that was a major thing and they wanted to improve that. They wanted to have a uniformity amongst the panels. So therefore program directors can pay attention to that. Uh, that's something that uh, is going on. Develop communication material to better explain actions being taken to mitigate potential negative impacts experienced by project investigators. Again, this relates to communication and documentation. Finally, the technology area, you know, virtual panels should be really robust, use the state of the art uh, technology that everybody can, can link in. Uh, these are a snapshot of some long-term opportunities re-engineer and streamline RFAs to be more user-friendly and consistent across NIFA. Uh, this again goes to communication. Communication really came up to be huge. NIFA-wide develop learning aids, training materials, and onboarding documents that are essential in educating new NIFA hires. This is something that, because especially NIFA, as you know, moved from DC to Kansas City, they lost 75% of their employees. They either retired or they just resigned, they, they found other jobs or they just didn't go because they had families and life in this area. Everybody couldn't move. So they're employing in fast pace and they have really uh, employed a huge number of employees now in Kansas City. But all I am trying to say is that uh, they wanted to make sure that onboarding documents are intact so they can actually uh, train this, these talents that are coming on board so they don't leave the stakeholders sort of in gap in terms of service that they need to provide. Yeah, I, so you can see these, these items here. I, I don't really have time to go through all of that. Another one, again, on technology, you can see that uh, complete a comprehensive redesign of NIFA's website in order to improve the logic of its architecture as well as to enhance the user experience. As you know, we deal with this too. This is something, an ongoing type effort and they are not an exception either. So um, this is a dashboard that uh, Cafe Board uh, with the help of MindLight Solutions, we came up and that is to really, uh, to basically update if anybody wants uh, to see the status of the reimagining NIFA or uh, looking at, uh, what has happened with CAFE activities and, and implementations, this is what really it is all for. It, on the left-hand side box, on this left-hand side of the screen, 
uh, or uh, yeah. So you see overall stats of Project Cafe, um, you know, gather feedback, of course, 100% were done, uh, analyze the data and provide recommendations, which we provided eight short-term and 40 long-term recommendations, 100% done. Improvement, uh, implementation improvements, well, it is really 99% done for the short-term uh, recommendations, but not others. This could be taken a little bit uh, sort of confusing, or it could be confusing, I guess it's 99%. Okay, so again, this is a recap for the sources, uh, 36 external, four internal, 900 comments total. And these were number of comments in each category. Process improvement was 200 comment, 204 count, 23%. Communication and documentation, you see 244 by far, it was the largest, 27%. Knowledge management, 77% uh, and, and so on and so forth. And um, funding requirements, you know, 4% uh, uh, of the comments. And these were all analyzed and synthesized. So, uh, and as a result of that, we came up with eight quick action and 40 uh, long-term actions. Improvements, you can see here that in this table on the right-hand side, uh, basically we suggested, CAFE board suggested eight short-term executive council. Actually, uh, you can see on the right hand of that table, I'm losing my cursor sometimes. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, so, um, so you can see on the right-hand side of the, uh, the table there uh, that, only they approved five of them to be implemented. Uh, I mean, they go with timing, people's time, and budget available, and all of the above. And these short-term opportunities underneath the status, as you can see, really for most part, those short terms are already uh, implemented pretty much, 99, 95%. So that's really where the cafe boards activities are. As initially I showed, my tasks were cafe board, chairing that. But the second item that I was involved while there uh, was with the multi-agency cybersecurity and AI committee. So it involved two aspects. One was AI IWG, artificial intelligence interagency working group. I mean, this was basically a committee that represented all the federal agencies, including FBI, CIA, you name it, USDA, NSF, DOE. And, and so on. So every two weeks they had a meeting and, and I represented, uh, they asked me to represent the NIFA. They didn't have really other national program leaders to represent, they were short handed. And so uh, they asked me to read a, a long report on a uh, broadband report that uh, NIFA already had done. And I extracted the page and delivered to the group, uh, you know, just how NIFA is after extending the broadband in rural areas if they want to implement AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning and data collection, they need the fast internet, they need this broadband in rural areas. So that's the activity that I was involved. Second part was NSF NIFA joint AI Institute proposal review and funding process. Um, in fact, just an hour ago, uh, Steve Thompson, who is actually national program leader, from NIFA representing in this joint effort, NIFA on NSF's AI Institute proposal. He just contacted me. If I had any notes, they wanna give a talk, any notes about our review process and reverse site visit that I could share with him. I promised him I'll do it sometimes this evening, but either way. So those were two items. Just a quick uh, thing that the first item that, uh, that I mentioned about now, the, this ruler is, this is the AI IWG type activities. You know, that committee involved, like for example, each agency, DOE, Office of Science, supporting domain specific foundational AI research and, and so on, data analysis and modeling. Each agency had their own interests. DOC, Department of Commerce and NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, is applying AI to measurement problems in domains such as materials, robotics, and wireless networking and all that. NSF collabor collaborations are focused on foundations of machine learning and AI and AI ethics, 
while Department of Homeland Security highlighted visual uh, uh, sort of questioning, answering technologies, black box evaluation, how they can take information and analyze and, and come up with uh, sort of strategies for uh, Homeland Security and so forth. And finally, USDA NIPA uh, and jointly with NSF, they were really focusing on development of foundational AI and application of AI and machine learning to agro ecosystem. These were sort of things that I was learning while I was uh, in that group. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, why is it not? Okay. And, and then the second task that was AI Institute proposal review funding area, there were two sets uh, of proposed calls uh, last year, planning grants, 1 million each, 27 were submitted. AI Institute grants 20 million each, 24 of them were submitted. I really didn't get involved with this one too much except at the last portion, but they really decided uh, in terms of outcome, as you can see here, uh, it, it was a standard panel review. Uh, they decided not to fund, I mean, leadership of NIFA decided they didn't wanna go that way. Uh, and so only selected one, uh, they provided 100,000 that if they wanna, beef up their proposal for next cycle. Uh, it's in some ways could be seen advantageous for them because this cycle, uh, that means that they can submit it. They have more time, much better uh, proposal and use those comments. Uh, let's see here, come on. Um, okay. And then uh, the AI Institute grant proposal, it had really two uh, steps standard panel review and selection of top three proposals. And then second item was reverse site visit for three top teams. Each one of these three top teams had to come and present. They were only allowed to bring 10, present, 10 people to present different aspects of their proposal. We asked questions, both the NSF program directors and couple of scientists from there and NIFA um, colleagues and myself, we asked them questions and they answered. Two, as a result, two proposals were selected. One was from UC Davis. Um, uh, PI was uh, Dr. Takapoulos from Computer Science, AI Institute for Aquaculture and Seafood Supply Chain. And the second was University of Illinois, AI and Artificial Intelligence for Future Agriculture Resilience Management Sustainability. This was for Midwest production systems, animal and plant production systems in Midwest conditions. So those were two uh, proposals selected. Now, as a result of those efforts, I really decided that maybe, you know, we should, we should go after one of the AI Institute proposals this year. So as a result, um, we started with the help of my colleagues, we started basically uh, submitting, uh, we, we developed a proposal and submitted on December 4th, uh, this past December of 2020s. Um, and uh, the, the title of our proposal was AI is creating resilience and sustainable food production systems in the Mid-Atlantic through real-time data-driven decision-making. We abbreviated this AIIMAR, Mid-Atlantic region. Requested funding is about 20 million, as you can see. There were 39 funded, funded participants, unfunded participants, collaborators were 21, and total team, 60 people. It was a huge effort. This was one of those limited submissions uh, we, we had to submit to university and I heard uh, from grapevines that there were 25. We were lucky to be selected one of two that could go out of university. So within six weeks, we had to develop this huge humongous proposal and, and uh, it took lots of, uh, lots of really effort on the part of everybody. Uh, ENSD participants, if I remember correctly, Paul Liznam, Masood, Nigahban Azar, Mitch Pavo Zuckerman, David Rupert, Deb, um, uh, Pat, uh, Patra and uh, and Bob Hill. Let's see here. Okay, and our proposal that we submitted, I already listed the title, but we had seven trust areas. One was the foundational AI. Really, these were the colleagues, four uh, colleagues from uh, computer science department really were effective in developing that component of the proposal. Trust number two was precision ag and nutrient management. David Rupert, our own David, uh, really led that, that team, but they were participants from, uh, by the way, 
in this proposal, we had six institutions that was besides us, UMES, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, the University of Delaware, um, uh, let's see, Penn State, Virginia Tech, West Virginia University, and a, an outside consulting firm um, uh, called the Williamsburg Institute of AI Institute of Technology and Teaching. So you see that it was very diverse, multi-institutional industry and so on. And our collaborators from, from institutions and diverse industry as well. So the third uh, this sort of trust area was food safety, security. Abani Pradhan led that trust area. Climate smart agroecosystem management. Uh, that was led by our colleagues in Essex, um, Liang Chang and, uh, and uh, uh, Ragu uh, Murt Murtagud, I guess his last name is, sorry. And trust number five, water resource optimization that was led by Masood. Uh, and trust number six, socioeconomic, socio-technical um, area, ethical implications, Paul Liznam led that, that uh, trust area. And trust number seven, education and outreach. Uh, really, that was led by uh, Bill Hubbard, our um, assistant uh, extension director uh, in uh, you know, cooperative extension, our own University of Maryland extension, and John Wan uh, from uh, Williamsburg Institute of Technology. They really collaborated on that. Uh, so, but they were people from all these other agencies involved in each one of these trust areas. So with that, I wanna end this, uh, end this uh, presentation by saying thank you for your attention. And I also recommend you all, if you wanna get familiar with CAFE more, you can go to this NIFA's website on Project CAFE Governance and, and you will see uh, some of the details and on the left hand side of the screen, you can click on the background of cafe and all that. So uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, um, should I stop sharing? Uh, you can maybe stop sharing and we'll see if we have some questions from our audience. Um, so we invite people to put questions in the chat if they'd like, or just to turn on your camera. Um, okay. Uh, so we'll give it a minute here. I guess I had a question um, just in terms of, uh, well, it, it struck me, you know, you were talking about efficiency and in, in, in the cafe goals of really trying to um, help people, but then you had mentioned this AI program where they had these 27 proposals that then they decided not to fund uh, any of them. And it, it struck me as kind of a kind of a surprise, uh, you know, to do that. And I guess, um, you know, what are your thoughts about, I mean, some of NIFA seems, some of maybe what it has been sort of a, I don't know, a real problem or a perceived problem with NIFA has been sort of these funding um, yes, uh, it's very, it's very yes, actually, these are feedbacks that I will be glad also to relay. Uh, they're asking always for feedbacks. That is, uh, Stephanie, look, uh, NIFA, to be honest with you, when they moved, despite lots of opposition from all, almost all the land grants and regional associations of extension research and so on, okay, but they moved. So they were at this array. Um, uh, let me just say, it came to conclusion that with these planning grants, apparently they had not taught, taught it well. If they would have basically funded these planning grants at 1 million, really they were disadvantaging future submissions from other institutions for AI Institute proposals. Again, remember, it is AI planning grants so if you get 1 million and beef up, because the consequence of that, they have to promise that there has to be AI in the suit. They were not even sure that they wanna, they have funds to do next cycle or not. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, last year, they were going to fund only one $20 million AI institute. When these two came to the top, uh, I don't mean to brag, but I really knew Prague uh, Chitnis for a very long time. And Steve Thompson, I know him from Tipton from postdoc era. So I, you know, I said, guys, you know, these are unique proposals from Midwest Illinois. I mean, you all have a lots of money because employment people did, you know, resigned and they're not. So they decided to fund two. 
So they decided to fund the University of Illinois. Illinois doesn't know this, but that was in last minute. They were initially going to fund only one and that was on, on RFA. So my point is for those planning grants, it, became, it, it was concluded that they may not be able to sustain. Secondly, they might disadvantage other institutions if they went ahead and, and funded two, three of those planning grants. So yeah, you can take it any way you want, but I think, but they are, that's why they really wanna streamline cafe board, cut these mistakes. We argued about these and discussed a deep, big detail. So they need to organize themselves. They need to streamline things. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it is pretty interesting. I, I know that there was a piece, I think maybe it was an NPR that was discussing NIFA just the other day, as well as the, the economic research administration moving. And they pointed out, you know, one of the interesting things is now, of course, they moved, but everybody's been virtual anyway. And so, you know, in essence, does it really even matter you know, like where people are, because I guess that where the headquarters in Kansas City has remained mostly empty, according to that article. So um, I wondered if you could speak, I mean, you you were on sabbatical with them, but I, I assume most of your work was virtual. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so basically, uh, since mine started March 1st, I went to DC, met with Scott. Uh, first, I mean, I had met with him back in November, but it doesn't matter. But I, I, you know, I met with him uh, regarding the cafe board, and we called upon uh, Parag Chetnis, who was in um, uh, Kansas that time. Uh, so we discussed our action plan and so forth. That was still in person; people were in the building. And uh, I, three days later, I went again uh, to meet with uh, both Scott and some of the people there, so to organize whom am I going to be working with in DC in terms of logistics, because they were supposed to fly me. Sometimes maybe I will go spend a week in, in Kansas City to meet with the other employees. But all of a sudden, you know, hell came to lose, unfortunately, because of COVID. So everything went on remote. It really was very disadvantaging, to be honest with you. And another thing that employees say is that, look, just like us, right? It is different than if you are in your office and I am in my office and in coffee break or whatever, I knock on the door. If your door is open, I say, hey, how are you doing? You know, I'm dealing with this. Do you, do you happen to have this in your lab? Those are things that NIFI employees miss as well, that human touch, human empowerment, right? So exchange of ideas. So they all are suffering from that. Let me put it this way. And that disadvantages them in some levels. Uh, Although, yes, uh, let's say they have joined programs with na other national uh, institutes, they are being conducted, as you saw my activities with the uh, uh, cybersecurity group, AI group. Um, so uh, you are doing it, but it is not improved. I don't know any of those representatives, you know, except, yes, yeah, some of them joined without any picture or any uh, thing. So you don't get to know people. You don't establish that long-term relationship anyway. Yeah. No, it's it's very true. I mean, it's it's interesting. I I guess so. Do you? I mean, is the long term plan? I mean, do you think that they will rehire? I mean, three quarters of their workforce, um, or do you think that they'll maintain sort of this smaller footprint going forward? I mean, what are your thoughts? So I'm not making. You know that both uh, NIFA as well as RE Research uh, Education Extension moved. Uh, I think together they had about 650, 700 employees. Bulk of it, uh, 350, 400 was NIFAS actually, I believe. So now I think they have about 260 employees, which they were down, way down. I mean, they were like, uh, if, I, if I say like uh, 70, 60, 70 people. So it was a huge, huge loss. Yeah, so they were, you know, yeah. But now they have been hiring every week. They have been, when I was there, I mean, I participated in several national program leader interviews, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, they asked me to participate and I asked questions. So they were really in a very speedy manner. They were bringing people on board. Okay, so we're, we're likely to see a lot of new names for, pro, for the programs that we're gonna be applying to in the, in the near you future. Would. I mean, one of the ladies, Anne Stapleton, for example, she got employed while I was there. 
uh, she is now she had joined on the sidelines with Steve Thompson for the technology part uh, for AI institutes and and so on. Yes. Okay. Um, so I didn't see anybody ask questions, but I guess maybe one follow following fo final question would be: um, So how did you go about arranging this sabbatical? If you know we have some people in the department that maybe are interested in this, um, or students, um, we have several grad students on. I mean, what are some suggestions you have if they're interested in in NIFA and working with NIFA? So you know, NIFA accepts uh, from students interns. So, and, and sometimes they have paid internships. So my point is for students, whether graduate or undergraduate, um, you know, idea is to be able to communicate. I don't know if they advertise, I haven't seen that, but I will suggest looking at the website, NIFA website, but uh, I will be more than happy to be a, a resource. Uh, if you all, anybody's interested in a given area, I can communicate with uh, colleagues that I know and they can direct us. Uh, so, and the same thing, you know, to be honest with you, with the faculty, Stephanie, the institute, I, you know, I arranged mine through Scott Engel because I knew him and Parag Chitnis, who was his deputy that time. Uh, so, uh, and they were coming to all our meetings, you know, Parag used to come to our Northeast Ag Experimental Station meetings and national meeting and so on and so forth. So I, I con, you know, constantly for several years, I knew them. So I communicated with them, but the idea is to communicate, right? So uh, for example, if somebody is in, uh, you know, environmental bioenergy area, maybe uh, Jim Dabrowski, who is the program director communicating with him, you know, they will, they will direct uh, us to where to go. Uh, soil health area or, you know, um, water and watershed and so on. So my point is um, it's communication. Yeah, they have the opportunities. Cool, yeah. And uh, Shannon chimed in to say, please send all internships and jobs to me for her um, blog to help students for undergraduates particularly. Um, but maybe maybe some of the grads also actually look at that. So that's, yeah, yeah. no, but I, I think you're right. Really important to connect with these people. And I mean, I've always found program officers to, well, most of them to be really helpful, I'd say so. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you all already know that, but the same thing is with ARS, right? I could get my sabbatical with hydrology remote sensing lab. I was meanwhile communicating with them. Yeah. And my point is just go to pure research. But because of experiences that nationally was being felt with NIFA, I, it was really tempting for me not only to go and get to know NIFA a little bit more better and see what's happening because I used to get upset with our programs here in Maryland when NIFA was not on time responding our faculty was complaining they oh they submitted progress report and Ruby was sending hey you gotta submit your progress report there wasn't much of you know streamlining going on so I I said okay I'll I'll just uh, do more of a bureaucratic type but I I wanted meanwhile let me just say that uh, for my just colleagues sake during that time, I served in PhD students committees uh, with Deb's leadership, Deb Patra's leadership, and involved in Paul and others, Abani. We submitted two proposals to NIFA. Uh, so with Masood and others, we were working on the sidelines with other staff with uh, the Maryland Interagency Water Council. My, my point is my sabbatical wasn't purely withdrawn, although maybe it is, it is not a, a good thing, but uh, yeah, so it was busy time for me and I kept busy. I am glad I did. COVID-19 was making me crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I understand that. Well, thank you, Adele, very much. I think it was really very interesting to hear, um, you know, and to hear about NIFA because, I mean, as you know, like you said, it's a very interesting time within that agency. So um, really interesting to hear more about it. Um, thank you. I, I really appreciate everybody's attention, your time, and you all have a wonderful afternoon. Yeah. And Marty, thank you. Yeah, Stephanie, thanks very much, Bill. Paul, yeah. Paul, yeah. Paul, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we'll see you next week. Uh, we have a new postdoc in the department under Gerpal Tours. Um, uh, they'll be presenting um, some research to us. So we look forward to seeing you then. Great. Thank you. Bye bye. Take, take care.